Good morning. I'm Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So grateful to be with a wonderful panel of folks trying to make a little sense out of the world today. So Aisha Hauser, how's it going? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser in Seattle. Um, and it's a you know, cloudy day, an unusual day here in Seattle. And uh, Jessica and I are on West Coast time. So I just feel the need to say that every week. Dina, how are you? I miss you. I'm good. Hi, everybody. I'm Christine Arrivada. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, oh, here is my, I don't know if you guys can quite see, there's my, uh, it's like the universe said, we're going to send some, some crappy stuff your way, but we're going to send you uh, the most cutest puppy ever to <laughs> give you some, some good loving and, and uh, service. So she is She's been already a chaplain dog. <laughs> Jessica, what are you up to this morning? I am on um, Facebook Live. I'm um, following your comments. I'll put those to the hosts. And I'm on um, Twitter, hashtag The View. And I am... Um, it's early here. I don't know why today feels extra early, Asia, but it do. So <laughs> it sure does. It feels like 4 a.m. Just FYI for everybody. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> well, I don't know about there, but here it's it doesn't really get light till after seven in this time. So yeah. And we're excited to have a guest host this week. Don Fortune, who has been here as a guest before, is joining us because Michael Tino is sick. Don, where are you and how are you? Um, I'm doing well. I'm Dawn Fortune. I am a minister in Galloway, New Jersey, and um, I am four-fifths time, which means I work four weeks on and one week off, and so this is my week off, and I've been playing in the garage and welding and having fun. It's been a, it's a wonderful week. Well, we're especially thrilled that you would think of us as time off. <laughs> Some people would, would call this work, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, and our special guest today is uh, Nate Walker, the Reverend Dr. Nate Walker. Nato potato is fun. Nato <laughs> potato, and, and unlike my doctor, you don't have to put his in quotes, he actually earned it. <laughs> oh, you earned it, you earned it. <laughs> so Nate is here to talk about all manner of things. Mm. Um, Nate, I forgot to ask you exactly how you want me to introduce you. So why don't oh, you yeah. introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Nate. I love CLF. I'm a, um, the community minister for religion and public life with CLF. And um, in my in my day job, I work uh, as as a strategic planner, fundraiser for various organizations on issues of religion and public life. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm calling in from Philly, and it's a beautiful, gorgeous day, which is disturbing to me because it reminds me of when Asia, when we were in New York and watching the Twin Towers fall, how beautiful it was. And the anthrax scare and working there, doing that ministry there. Oh my God, it was horrible to have, you know, you want it, it would have been better if we were in this horrible storm, right? But it was so beautiful out while we were dealing with all that trauma. And that reminds me of today. Well, yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about today, all, all manner of trauma in public life, and much of it tied to some people's idea of religion. Um, so many places to start with this. Um, gosh. Let's start with just our own selves, Unitarian Universalists. And Christine, I just wanted you to say whatever you might want to say to finish up. We had a conversation last week about what is a Unitarian Universalist um, asserting themselves into your life. And if there's anything you'd like to say, or if you just want to say, I want to talk about it, that's fine too, but your call. I appreciate it. I just wanted to name the elephant in the room and also because it, it probably does relate to what we're going to talk about today. And I wanted folks to feel um, comfortable in, in doing that. Um, I really appreciate, um, we've had so many folks reach out to us as a family um, in support, um, many who are on the screen right now, um, and, you know, want to know what they can do or, you know, how we are, and, uh, you know, 
basically the party line is um, trauma takes time. And, you know, when you're in recovery from that, um, it's not something that happens in days or weeks. Um, it's something that, you know, happens over months and um, it surfaces in different ways um, that people don't always um, kind of connect the dots. And sometimes it's really easy to connect the dots. Um, but it, it's going to take time. And, and that's just, you know, something that we're trying to, to navigate through as a family. Um, and we've really appreciated um, folks who have uh, reached out and support and um, some folks that uh, haven't reached out and support um, and have actually done the opposite. Uh, you know, our, our uh, thoughts and prayers are with you all because uh, it's obviously some, some things that folks are working out in these times. And, and I think that's part of what we need to, to talk about today is um, not just in Unitarian Universalism, but, you know, um, the, our, I've always, we've always said our small microcosm is just, um, you know, uh, a harbinger of, of what's going on larger. And so it shouldn't be any surprise that these things are happening within Unitarian Universalism um, when they are happening, you know, outside of Unitarian Universalism and, um, and that our faith, you know, it, it can't just be on Sunday. It has to be all the other days of the week. Amen. Well, I'm sorry to hear that there are people <laughs> who need to keep on the assault. Uh, let's talk about a continuum of violence because that's that's what we're looking at, from threats to bomb. You know, um, we've changed the title this morning. Nate's clever title from f bombs to pipe bombs, but you know. Um, Nate, tell us what you see, uh, you've been studying this, you know, the continuum of violence and how religion plays into it. So <clears throat> right now we are in an age of contempt. And, and I use that word very, very specifically, drawing upon some psychological studies that look at marriage. Um, they look at 30 different years of studies of couples. And if one of them is showing contempt for another, um, the psychologist can predict with 90% accuracy that they're going to have a divorce. And I think ultimately our country is going through a divorce. We're seeing these elements of contempt that start out with um, nonverbals, like in political debates, the rolling of the eyes, the dismissing, um, the scoffing, the, sar the sarcasm um, that's very, very biting, that lacks any kind of generosity. So you get to see sort of the early stages of contempt in, in our body language and in our actual language. And what's happening right now is that we are a public that is more divided than in, we've seen in history. So some of the polls show that um, outgroup out group animus and in-group favoritism is at an all-time high. Um, the political uh, views held by both Democrats and, and Republicans are more divergent than in recorded history. So we are in an age where there's- When this, you say recorded history, you mean US. <clears throat> US history. I mean, certainly yeah. other places have gotten more divided. Okay, I just wanna- I should that. say since the recording of this same topic, which was um, in the 1920s, right? So when they're looking at, um, uh, behavior uh, and, and values shared by parties and so on. Um, the other thing is we're getting to see a lot of otherizing language. Um, Meg and I uh, worked on the book Cultivating Empathy together and that where we talk about sort of listening in for the rhetoric of otherizing when somebody is being demonized um, or being colonized or generalized or trivialized or hom homogenized or vaporized. Um, these, are, these are ways that to make somebody the other. And when that happens, um, there is, you can justify their elimination. Um, and so, you know, Meg, you were, you were saying earlier about your insights on, and your, your studies about how if you don't see somebody as a person, right, it can lead to 
to violence against that person. Well, it's not my studies. It's American history. It's, I mean, I was acknowledging um, a line that my kid found in research in the, the Constitution of Virginia in the 1600s that said, if you kill a Black person, it is as if you did not kill a person. And so once you declare people not to be people, anything that you do isn't a thing because they're not people. And, and I was lifting that up both because my kids said it to me and then looked at me and said, how do you stand to be white? And I was said, fucking A, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> From F-bombs. <laughs> Oops, delete. Uh, (laughs) You know, but really, looking at our history, we have otherized and wiped out so Native, I mean, so many people that I think we who are white are seeing stuff anew that people have, I mean, I wonder about those polarizations and how they've existed around race and, and people's analysis of stuff for a long time, because I think for those of us, who are white, at least speaking for myself, you can ignore a lot for a long time and and just be okay. Just think you're okay because you don't know anything. And so once you see it and you go, holy cow, this has been going on for you know 500 years here and I've been sitting it out. Um, anyway, so, so that is to say the otherizing that we're seeing now is visible to some of us who have, who have known it for 500 years in their cells. So um, just, just to name that. And, and this, this otherizing is taking on a whole, whole new <clears throat> power <clears throat> right now. And so one of the things we're seeing in the demographics is an increase in social hostilities, uh, hate crimes, violence, um, Anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. Hate crimes against Muslims are higher in this last year, according to FBI data, than they were um, after 9-11 or any other time. This rhetoric of having 42 different states sort of introduce laws to ban Sharia, the, the travel ban itself and the political rhetoric around that to to create a registry. Wait a hold on, I missed something. 42 states did what? 42 states have introduced anti-Sharia bills, meaning to ban the use of religious justifications that Muslims might use um, in living their lives. And so it's this, based on this perception that one, Islam is foreign. Um, and that's the, what these copycat bills say is the banning foreign religion. Um, and the courts overwhelmingly find them unconstitutional because of course they are. You can't establish religion. You can't privilege one over another or privilege religion over non-religion. And so what's strange is that governors continue to sign into law these bills they know are unconstitutional. Um, Sam Brownback of Kansas was one of them and he was now appointed by uh, President Trump to be the ambassador for religious freedom in the United States, for the United States. Um, and so I, I've, when looking at this, I'm seeing that it, it's a kind of political strategy that's a perfect recipe. If I get the public to fear the other, in this case, Muslims, then um, you need me to protect you from them. And if the courts overrule me, then you need me in order to appoint new justices. So it's a, it's a perfect political recipe for maintaining power, for rallying a base. Um, so this is and, the- And I would add that just that, that just that it's on the ballot, just that it's, it's, it's being given the cover, the protection of something that should be debated, that should be something that we look at from a perspective of not just politics, but law and values just that that nugget alone that it should be part of the public discourse um, to have this debate um, is part of the tactic of you know of yes to everything you just said Nate of all those other steps 
um, but even just the, the, the kernel of how it grows, that this is something that is worthy of protection from um, is, is part of that entire, um, not just othering, but shifting of where our attention is and goes to. That, that's right. That's exactly right. And I think it's in this time you getting you're beginning to see the legitimization of otherizing and it is resulting in actual discrimination, actual hate crimes, actual incitement to violence. And I'll give you a couple examples. So um, at Liberty University, for instance, um, is the f fourth largest um, public uh, private school in in the country. And um, Jerry Falwell, as the president of it, um, uh, just in, in, 2000, in 2015, was speaking in front of a, a huge auditorium of students, We're talking 10,000 students. And this is what he said. I've always thought if more good people had concealed carry permits, then we could end those Muslims before they walked in and killed them. Um, the crowd then erupted in applause. You can watch this on YouTube. It's incredibly disturbing. And then he continued and said, I wanted to take this opportunity to encourage all of you to get your gun permit. We offer a free course. Let's teach them a lesson if they ever show up here. This is the president's advisor on religion and public life. And he's calling for his students to take up arms if a Muslim enters their campus. So this is an incitement to violence, right? And so when asked um, a week later, did you really mean this? He said, if I had to say what I said again, I'd say the, exactly the same thing. And so it's in this context that we're seeing all kinds of um, rises of hate crimes against Muslims in particular. So right now, um, one in five families are experiencing, uh, Muslim families are experiencing um, some kind of act of bullying of their child in public schools. And then of those families, of those children who are experiencing that, the bully, one out of four times are the teachers. So an example is like a, a public school teacher is ripping off a eighth grade girl's hijab, her headscarf, and he's saying, he's petting her hair, saying pretty hair, pretty hair. And he says, you, you need to liberate yourself. You're, you're, aren't you a feminist? And how do we know that this happened? Because he himself recorded it on his phone and posted it. So if, if the president and his advisors are saying these negative things toward the vulnerable minorities of our time, then other public officials, in this case, public school teachers, are one in four likely to be the actual perpetrators of bullying in the schools. So, so um, sorry, I, I just reacting because I was my mother, I was raised Muslim, my mother has worn a hijab since she was 17. Um, Yes, it has gotten much worse. And as, when, as soon as you said public school teacher, I remembered my, I think she was the seventh grade teacher um, who both disliked my mother and me. So um, some version of this, while no, not, it absolutely got, has gotten more egregious, but this is, I was the only girl named Aisha in uh, the school system. Um, people would ask me why my mother wore that thing on her head. Why didn't we celebrate Christmas? And this teacher in particular, um, she she was really um I, I mean was she islamophobic probably but she was just heinous and she would just was not giving me a break so my mother came in to complain and i found out uh i had i was sick um and she actually told the entire class showed the entire class my papers and how she was right and give whatever the hell the issue was the grade that she gave me um but it was humiliating so some so i just want to make sure that we realize that some version of this however subtly has been going on. And I and no, I never wore a hijab in school, so I didn't have that, but my mother did. And I knew the look she got and I was called camel jockey, sand, N-word. Um, 
throughout my whole school. So including college where I went to actually a pretty diverse college. So I, I don't want to let this country off the hook that all of a sudden we have the current hate pumpkin in the White House and it came out of nowhere because I flip and felt it. The other thing I want to do, because I, I, I totally, this is all, um, it's painful. It's very, very painful to hear and it's disturbing and it's all true. At some point in the show, I do want to not let Unitarian Universalists off the hook because this whole in out, we're very good at. Um, Christina Rivera, who's on here, has gotten hate mail more than once in writing. Um, you know, we've gotten emails. We've so so I don't want us to think that we're immune from this kind of othering and how I've seen people be treated. And, um, you know, when a person of color is walking around our congregations, oh, may I help you? Is this your first time here? Maybe they were a member for 10 years. So so we need to be mindful that, yes, this is got it's it's what's happening is absolutely pushing the limits of what is I mean, we're we're. The parallels to Nazi Germany are not overstated. And we need to be careful that Unitarian Universalists do not absolve themselves and say, oh, that those are the bad people over there. We have people who other in our own spaces. Um, that That's just what I want to say. Well, and so Nate's talking about a continuum, but I want to, I, I want to say something with that because every time I've heard that what I should just said come up in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. The next person who speaks says, and we've all heard them, no one is treated worse here than a Trump voter, or nobody has a harder time here than a white Republican cisgender man. So I wanna lift up the difference between targeting people who are marginalized, oppressed, and using power to clobber them and affirming every single idea and person who, who ever say or do anything, especially people who are benefiting from targeting those groups. And so I, I just want to finish, I mean, just amend, because I think that we've all been in that room and then the whole conversation turns to, oh, that poor Trump voter and how bad they felt. And, and, I, and I, so, yeah. Yes, yes, Megan. And I, you know, I take that a step further because I think in Unitarian Universalism, we are at, at a precipice um, that we've been at before. And, and that always comes up is, well, are you saying that those folks aren't welcome here anymore? Um, and, you know, we hear in our congregations, you know, the sorrow and grief for members who have left because, um, the church's stance on racial justice, or that they have a Black Matter, Black Lives Matter sign now, um, and we hear, you know, from from continuing members of how deeply it hurts that other um, congregants have left because of that. And one of the things I try and lift up when we talk about that is the vast numbers of POC who come through our doors that leave and never have a group of white folks chasing after them to say, why did you leave? Or, you know, I'm so sorry that we couldn't make that work. Or he, you know, expressing their grief over um, folks who we are supposed to be the most radically welcoming of um, and a sanctuary for. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. We shift that conversation so easily to, you know, the, the white male cisgender Republican that we're not welcoming to without giving any um, thought to the folks that, um, the most marginalized folks that we are supposed to be a sanctuary for. Um, and so that's really, you know, I'd say to the people listening, you know, when you're having these conversations in your congregations, that is the response um, in, in trying to not be sucked down that that rabbit hole of you know trying to go after that one or two people um, who are come from extraordinarily privileged many times uh, to be able to walk away um, and redirect and shift our focus of really you know what is our what is our congregation here for what is our faith here for yeah who's our congregation here for oh Don you're trying to get in yeah um well I I've been mindful that I'm I'm 
trying to sit back and let others speak. Um, <clears throat> um, but I also know that I'm here, so I'm supposed to I'm supposed to say something. Um, <clears throat> so I had this conversation this past weekend at a new member a workshop sort of thing that we had, um, where um, I mean it was a different vein, but we were talking about the difference between um, the inherent worth and dignity of all people, and you can just do anything here. Um, and what I said was, every person has worth and dignity. Every behavior does not, and every idea does not. You can have lots of ideas, but if you think the world is flat, I'm gonna tell you you're wrong, okay? And my job as the minister is not necessarily to make you comfortable or to make you happy. If you want a lollipop and a pat on the head for being a good liberal and showing up here every Sunday, this is not your place. This is, this is you're not gonna get what you want here. <clears throat> so my job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And um, I'm working on a, um, um, a newsletter column um, that's due this week um, about the difference between, and this is prompted by a, a colleague, uh, Reverend Diana McLean up in Peterborough, New Hampshire, but the difference between being political in the pulpit and being prophetic. And um, I had somebody walk out a couple weeks ago um, <clears throat> because they didn't like the stuff I was saying about the confirmation process for our most recent Supreme Court justice. Um, and I spoke some very hard truths. And um, this person was a lifelong Republican and, um, and their partner spoke to me and I said, you know, I can't change the truth. Um, and, and frankly, what I said after the election in 2016 was, if you voted for Donald Trump, that was an act of violence. That was an act of violence and we have a covenant of right relationship here. And so if you behave in this way, this is not gonna be a comfortable place for you. You know, um, supporting the, and I try hard to not do the other thing that Nate's been talking about, <clears throat> but supporting a regime that wants to erase my identity, just sort of redefine gender and, and say, poof, no more trans people, who thinks it's okay to put children in cages. If you support that, I don't care for what reason, you like tax cuts or whatever, if you support that, that's wrong. It's wrong. And the, the, the dance that I have to do on that very fine line between being prophetic and sounding like a jerk, um, <laughs> some days I do it and some days I don't, um, is that we have to, we have to, I have to root everything I say in our values. And our values are simple, but they are not easy. Um, and to draw us back to that, but there is just some stuff that is wrong. And there is some stuff that we are not going to change anyone's mind by hoping that the other side will see reason or be polite. We cannot reason with fascists. It's the truth. Um, and so people say, well, that means you're shutting down the conversation. I'm like, okay, I'm all right with that, actually. I, I'm okay with that. Um, I, I've got more productive places to put my energy. But so those are my thoughts. Thanks, Don, and, and thanks for lifting up the, the erasure and eradication of trans people, which the administration just decreed this week, which again comes from religion. Uh, that is a uh, that is who Mike Pence is through and through. Donald Trump, it'll get out the vote. 
and that's what he cares about with the, with the base. But um, the, the violence that can be done with decrees like that, we, we know Nate, but, and you know much more in detail about how behavior like that on the part of authority figures gives permission to the already rampant, as Aisha said, this isn't new, but it's picking on people who are the most vulnerable and who are already targeted and who they have probably done focus groups to decide they can afford to, um, to lose. Um, I, I, I know politics well enough to know that they did that. So I'm curious, Nate, you know, when you see something like that, you, it goes into your brain in different ways than my mother's brain, which just goes to <laughs> wanting to go fight with somebody. But what, what do you do? I draw upon this, this theory of change, <clears throat> which is to count to five. Think of a one is somebody who is ideologically ex uh, very, very different than a five. They have different views, so much so that they often don't even hear one another. They don't understand their rhetoric. They cannot actually communicate. But um, the two and the three and the four who are uh, sort of represent the spectrum of views on that tend to be sort of caught in, in that uh, extremism between this and that. A, a three who is sort of the middle of the road on these topics can often speak to both the one and the five. Um, in this theory, you can only really speak uh, two more than where you're at. So a two and a four can communicate with each other, but they can't communicate to the other, other side. So what I tend to do is um, in an age of extremes, not to speak to the extreme as a strategy in order to keep those who are two, three, four, morally grounded, <laughs> to keep the, keep the two, three, fours somehow in a, in a, to make, to differentiate them and to educate um, as a strategy. Now, there's definitely the storm the castle, uh, shut down the conversation that needs to happen. These are ultimate strategies, and this is just one other in our toolkit for reform. So in that context, you know, one of the things I do when I hear about the sort of the separation of families, I'll ask somebody, uh, for instance, um, who was raised in Pennsylvania. This is a conversation I had just a couple of weeks ago. I said, oh, well, um, yeah, what are, you, what, what are your insights about that? And then they, they talk about how immigration is a problem and the caravans are coming and there's all, um, you know, no, I don't necessarily think Mexicans are rapists. I'm not that extreme, but, you know, I, I do think that this is the major issue. And so I support his policy, right? So there's like a, a, a two on the one of the extreme scale. And so I just ask a factual question. Oh, well, do you know the origins of, of this? And they're like, no, well, what, what's the origins? And they're like, oh, it would, didn't Jeff Sessions start it in 2007, the, in 2018? I was like, no, no, the real origins. And that is George Washington in 1790 until Eisenhower in 1954, they all had one legal definition of citizen, white. You had to be white in order to become a US citizen. We're talking 36 presidents had this. We're talking multiple Supreme Courts reaffirming this, countless Congresses reaffirming this. So the basis of this idea of immigration in this legal system is based on whiteness. And so when I ask them, oh, well, well, certainly you know the stories of the federal government hiring Christian missionaries in order to create federal boarding schools to separate the adult indigenous families um, from the children and in order to Christianize the children, cutting off their hair, removing their garb, um, changing their names, requiring them to speak English and converting them to Christianity. You know the federal government funded that for over 70 years and over 200,000 children were then converted to Christianity that way. They're like, what? That doesn't happen. And I was like, well, well, you know, other contemporary examples of this with after Bill Clinton signed the NAFTA agreement, 1.5 million Mexican farmers lost their corn farm industry 
And then American businesses would come over and bus them over for temporary work visas and say, oh, sorry, the temporary work visa is gone, but we'll go ahead and allow you to work here, um, but you'll be undocumented. And many of these undocumented workers work in the meatpacking industry as articulated in Food Inc, where you have um, uh, 10 to 15 people who are undocumented picked out by ICE each day so as to not disrupt the, the workforce. So this is a government business collaboration in order to create undocumented workers, one. Two, to then raid them in the middle of the night. And they're usually the ones who are making some kind of complaint about the health conditions of these meatpacking industries. And then three, separating the adults from the children in the, right then and there. So this idea that separating of families is somehow one new and two somehow should be shocking is, um, is actually a continuation of a long standing legal administrative attempt in order to otherize, in order to protect a certain type of person in order to otherize another. So when for me, these are the types of conversations I try and have um, in order to help people not go to further into an extreme, but to ground them into some history. And how did that conversation go with a person from Pennsylvania? Did they care about any of that? Um, they, they sometimes say, oh yeah, I, I knew about that, or, uh, but I don't think they, they did necessarily, or they'll, they'll kind of have a reaction of, um, it's like a, when, you know, when you see somebody have a paradigm shift right then and there, and they're like caught in of like, but that's not my narrative. <laughs> like <laughs> you, you get to see this kind of incongruence. And so I, I like that kind of using education to disrupt our narrative. I like the idea of, of using that as a strategy. Um, so I don't know necessarily if it necessarily changed them per se, um, but I, I, I'm hopeful that it would. Well, one thing you did is move the conversation from now, which might touch a different part of their brain that hasn't been influenced by Fox News. You know, because my main frustration trying to, and I am the quintessential white woman who will be friendly to anybody, Mrs. Santa Claus kind of persona. Um, but when people have been brainwashed, I find no ability to have a conversation with them because there's no common ground. I mean, there's, we could just change the subject and talk about knitting or something, though I don't knit, but you know, I could fake that, but there's no common ground. I mean, when you say that about the polarization, I am somebody who tries to talk to white people because I feel like my body radiates safety, you know, but I, I am finding it increase and maybe it's, but it's, it's for me and I'm willing to, I rode a plane just now with a hunter and we just talked about hunting as if I think it's a great thing. I'm willing to go to go into other people's worlds, but when, when their world is one that's been created by lies, I honestly don't know how to continue that conversation. And most of the people I know, I don't have relatives who are Trump voters, but, but the people I know, a lot of people who do, a lot of white people who say, we just don't talk about it. We just never talk about politics. And I honestly, at first I was really mad at him about it, but the more I've tried with people like their families, the more I've seen why, because they're, they're really dead end conversations. And I'm, I'm eager for strategies for white people, particularly to talk to other white people um, about this stuff, because um, I, I thought I was pretty good at it, but boy, am I not. I, I often, and maybe it's because I'm a five, I don't know, you know, but, but I, I feel like I, um, and I'm not full time in a church like you are, Don, you know, I'm, I'm doing a quarter time in a suburban, very white congregation. And, um, and we're, you know, we're venturing into this territory. I don't know how successfully though. 
you know, because you just, and the liberal loop is also pretty closed as we've heard. I mean, so it, it, I don't know. Anyway, I don't even know what I'm asking, except I'm just saying, Nate Walker, you've got a degree in this. Help me. If, if it, if it's, it, I, like I said, I want to, I want to lift up my cool, weird little congregation down by the Jersey shore. Um, <clears throat> in that group of 13 people considering new membership, there were four different queer people, four, five people under 40, one under 30, three people of color, and one person um, with um, significant mobility challenges who gets around in a chair, electric chair. So, I mean, it's, I don't know what's bringing them here in this very white little corner of New Jersey, this very white, very red little corner of New Jersey but they found us. Um, now we'll see if this batch comes through because that'll change about 10% of our population. Okay, I've got about 110 members and I've got 13 people. So that's about 10%. And that typically is when things get uncomfortable for a little bit until you reach a new normal. So we'll see what happens, you know, when they start to, to, to fully integrate um, with the community. I'd love to ask Nate, because one of the things that I get frustrated with, and maybe the answer is what you already spoke to from the scale of one to five, I've heard that before, but um, uh, I still hear people say, well, you don't want to, this is you use now, um, when, when we still, still people want to argue with me about the words white supremacy, oh, which just exhausts me. And, and they say, well, you know, you're losing people that you'd have. And I'm like, meh, I'm not convinced that we had those people. If all it takes is naming white supremacy culture, which is reality, because really reality is antagonistic. Real, if we're going to be honest, reality, what's happening is antagonizing, um, especially those on the margins, especially those that, the, that um, th this administration wants to erase trans people who will not be erased. So that reality is antagonistic. So I guess, Nate, when you were talking about that scale, I mean, I, I don't buy that argument. I don't buy that because, uh, uh, you know, if please and thank you brought liberation, we would have done it with Washington, right? Like it took me 17 years to become naturalized and I was here when I was two and I didn't become a citizen until I was 19. Um, and so, so I, I don't know. I wonder about that. Like, are, am I really going to convince someone who wants to argue about with me about the earth being flat and white supremacy culture is not a thing? Is, is that I, I just genuinely don't feel I have the energy to waste my time. However, I'd like to hear if that's the theory is the one to five thing. Yeah, I think if that's conversation, then you would be wasting your time because uh, the, the, the divide is too, too vast between those two conversations. Um, one way to change the conversation um, is to uh, connect in with other viewpoints where that person finds authority. Oh, wasn't that interesting that Laura Bush came out against the separation of families policy, the zero tolerance. Oh, isn't that interesting that the Methodist charged Jeff Sessions with child abuse for introducing this separation policy. Oh, isn't that interesting that the Catholic bishops found it immoral and that the evangelical roundtable all came out against it, that the Southern Baptists voted in a democratic process in order to keep families together. Isn't that so something about drawing upon the resources of people that they might find as legitimate in order to understand that the view that the un- um, examined view that they had on that topic um, is is it more extreme than people um, in their own camp? I think that could be a strategy. But I mean, like you use so, for example, I, I that's yes. I mean, I, I, the folks I'm talking about would be on board with that. Like Jeff Sessions sucks; these people are terrible. Sure, I'm saying this is an art. My congregation, the congregation where I'm currently director of lifelong learning, please don't use the word. This is still happening. It just happened last weekend. Uh, you're calling us white supremacists. Please stop using those words because you're losing people. And these are you use. You're losing people who you would you would ordinarily have. And I, my, what I'm saying is, I'm not convinced. I don't I don't understand that if you're saying we're still all part of a UU congregation. So I'm I'm talking about within our from our people. 
there are many conversations happening simultaneously here. And I wanted to lift up a comment from, from, and I hope I get this right. T, is that how you say that first name? Does anyone know? T. Resendiz de Perez writes, the one through five model works if we're looking at an issue of varying opinion, but when it is applied to an issue like trans or native liberation, it falters. When the one's worldview negates the existence of another, that other group cannot be considered the fives. And that group should not be considered extreme for insisting on their own existence. <laughs> Amen. The idea that we will be saved by folks who have chosen a middle ground on moral issues is disturbing. Um, so I think, I think we're having a really complex conversation about many different um, strategies and communities. And I am pretty much an all strategies person, but I just want to affirm that point because yes, absolutely. That I think Nate, you're talking about political differences when you say that. So I just want to hear your response to that comment. Yeah, Ty, I, I want you on the show. We need your uh, wisdom more in this conversation. You're right. When it comes to um, issues of fundamental human rights, fundamental um, dignity of all persons, I mean, there is no moral um, relevancy. There is no um, middle ground in these ways. So I think that that's accurate. Um, uh, I'm, I'm talking more about sort of theories of change uh, that leads someone to um, change their mind on, on policy issues. Um, and I, this is relevant to me because I don't know about you all, but I'm doing get out the vote work right now. And I am talking to people with a very broad range of beliefs. Here in Minnesota, we have Keith Ellison running for attorney general, a really important role for protecting all kinds of targeted communities. And Keith is Muslim. And the anti-Muslim, the right wing has deployed people to Minnesota and they're all over it. And Keith's former girlfriend also said that he was abusive to her in the course of their breakup. So it's gotten really ugly in terms of his ex-wife being dragged. I mean, it's, it's gotten really ugly. And I feel like these different conversations about gradation, I, I am like, we cannot allow this right wing guy who makes Jeff Sessions look liberal be our, our attorney general or so many communities will be in such deep trouble in Minnesota. So I'm out there talking to people about Keith Ellison, and I'm having a lot, a lot of challenging conversations. Um, so I think I think we're talking about lots of different things at once, and they're all painful. I just I just want to say they we're on a continuum of suckiness, and it's like in a really really sucky time that we're in together. So I, I want to. I, I agree, Meg, um, but I would like to affirm Aisha's point that when we're talking about it from a uh, perspective of Unitarian Universalism, um, which is why all of us are on, on this particular show, um, we affirm as our faith a certain set of values and a certain way, a, a certain theology, um, that some of those conversations um, shouldn't be where we have to be, right? And, and um, when we are derailed so often to having those baseline here, you know, baseline, what I would term as baseline, here are human rights issues that, like when we have to affirm our own humanity within Unitarian Universalism, that is, I think, what he is trying to get towards of the, and, and, you know, what Asia is saying, hmm, did we really have these folks to begin with? Um, because I think in the wider world, yes, when we're going out and doing social justice work, um, the, the strategies that Nate is talking about is absolutely crucial that we're, that we're employing those strategies, uh, particularly when we're doing interfaith work and when we're, we're out. But when we are talking about what we believe as congregations um, and co covenanted communities and where we, I'm not gonna use ableist language or not where we stand, but where we are um, in terms of what we hold as um, our baseline values, those conversations, I think we do need to have a conversation about what those are. And, and I, 
I do believe that that not everybody who identifies as Unitarian Universalist is going to be comfortable uh, with those conversations. And I and I do believe that not everybody who thinks that they're Unitarian Universalists will stay. Um, and and that that is the single hardest conversation that I see we have within Unitarian Universalism because we are not willing to say not everybody is going to make it as a UU. And boy, you say those words. Aisha and I and Takia did a white UU white supremacy teaching workshop, and that was one of the questions we got, and that was one of the answers I gave. And I can't tell you the, the backlash that I get, got to that one answer of sometimes we are going to have to affirm the, the inherent worth and dignity of somebody as we walk them to the door. Um, and that does not mean that we don't value them as a person, but there has to be some discernment within Unitarian Universalism as it, as to who we are and what we're willing to risk. Amen. And just to affirm what you said earlier that lots of people of color have left. Lots and lots of people of color have left. And yeah, yeah. Whoa, uh, we have a lot of viewers. This is, this is important, <laughs> a important time to be together and talk and Who's who's ready for uh, a new piece of all of this? I'd like to I'd like to touch on something that Christina just said about as a culture, Unitarian Universalism or Unitarian Universalists seem to be living in um, a, a culture of scarcity. Like we can't afford to lose anybody. Like there's this leftover thing from the 1950s when everybody went to church and our, we had churches with, you know, 5,000 members and they weren't that uncommon. And now we have the majority of our churches have, you know, 100 members, right? And if we lose three, that's scary, especially if they're big pledgers. And so um, the reality, I mean, it's easy to take risks when you have a parachute. You know, when you know that if we lose five people, so what, we've got 500, okay? As opposed to if we lose five people, that's, you know, possibly a quarter or 20% of our budget, you know? Um, and so <clears throat> I think sometimes um, leaders and congregations have that playing too large in their heads when they think about how are we gonna take a prophetic stand? Um, and we have a culture of what I call toxic niceness, where we don't wanna to say to somebody, that thing you did or that thing you said was racist because we might hurt their feelings. Um, and yet that is the whole point of a covenant is that we call one another into this shared agreement of how we're gonna be in community with one another. And so it's, it's, we need to get over that fear and I'm not sure how we do that. Um, but, but I think that plays large, larger behind the curtain than um, I think a lot of us want to recognize or acknowledge. I had a white UU minister woman say to me, white UU minister, the social justice minister say that I needed to say things so she can hear them. So this, this isn't, we, we need to be mindful that some of this is also among our spiritual leadership um, mm. who have been pretty heinous. And so I've had this said to me just within the last five years. Um, so you're right with the toxic niceness. And so I get blamed for speaking truth to power by a UU minister saying, you need to shut that down and say it the way I can hear it. I think there's a fundamental <clears throat> misunderstanding of what is the purpose of a congregation. And I'm, I'm going to be very, very blunt here. 
too many Unitarian Universalists think their congregation is a, is a country club. No, it is a training ground. It is a training ground for moral, spiritual development. It is a training ground on how to do that emancipatory work in order to live out our deepest values. And that has to come with a very big and beautiful and ugly mirror into our character. So if there's any kind of resistance when it comes to, oh, you need to talk pretty and look nice in order for me to hear, then there's a fundamental misunderstanding of why we gather. We're not gathering for a social club and to have tea. What? We're here because it's a training ground, people. And so I think if we start to shift to what is the purpose of this place and get people to buy into that larger purpose, then maybe they will see each sermon, each encounter, each conflict as an opportunity for their own moral and intellectual and spiritual development. Amen, spoken by someone who left the parish ministry. Uh, <laughs> I, I want... I want to say that if Fox News is broadcasting people, I mean, brainwashing people, white supremacy has brainwashed people like me for 500 years. I mean, so it is so deeply held. So those same conversations I'm saying are frustrated with brainwashed people. Are, are about me and the ways that I am brainwashed around whiteness and white supremacy and racism and all of those things. And so, uh, you know, we are trying to do something hard is, is what I'm saying. And people of color suffer <laughs> for how badly we're trying to do it. And, and um, I think these times that we're in call us to, to draw on reserves especially those of us who are privileged to draw on reserves that we were not trained to have and that church has to be a place to help us with that, you know, and, and if it isn't, we are not going to be strong enough. It's um, somebody said in the chat, it's a gym. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a spa. It's a gym, Dawn. Yeah. That's great. And, I love it. And the other thing I will say, Meg, is that, um, you know, people of color have, have had that same brainwashing. You know, we have that same internalized, um, why are people treating me this way? What the, what the fuck? Or um, what the, <laughs> you know, what, what's going on? And then you're like, oh, that's right, racism. Like, you know, we are, we are, and particularly those of us that have, that are closer to white privilege, that are closer to um, that on the, on the color spectrum, um, you know, that internalized uh, racism and um, anti-blackness that, that is carried um, by our nation is just, you know, devastating when you are awoken to it and is also something that, that um, if our congregations are a gym for our members is also creating space to hold people of color as we grapple with um, what white supremacy has meant to us in our own internalized um, racism. I want to acknowledge, Ty, I did mispronounce your name and I apologize for that. Like a bow tie, you say, and that's great. And, and just lifting up that the theory of change that Nate mentioned doesn't allow the oppressed group any power in creating change because they don't exist on the spectrum of the political issue. So interesting. We could have a whole nother hour on that, I bet. And um, these are such important conversations and we're coming to the end of our time. Jessica, you unmuted. Did you want to say something? I didn't unmute, but I'm happy to have my face pop up for a second. Oh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought maybe you had something profound to say. I think next week ARE is going to join us, Allies for Racial Equity, to talk about the work that they've been doing. We're in conversation, but stay tuned. Um, thank you so much, uh, Don, for, for being here. It's great to have you. Um, let's all go work out at, at 
the places that build the spiritual muscles to do this work in these times we were made for. <laughs>